Hey guys, it's Dr. Ruth. Hope y'all are doing well. And uh, if you live in the southeast, you were probably enjoying the storm as much as we were last night. So we found out that Gracie, our new uh, our new dog, is unfortunately afraid of thunderstorms. She's deaf, so the uh, the thunder isn't so much of a problem, but the lightning was definitely freaking her out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and uh, some things you can do that don't involve um, drugs and things of that nature. And, um, and also how you can apply that to a question that somebody asked me um, about her little chihuahua that's, uh, that's also very fearful of just going outside. So um, to start with, though, I wanted to, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about about uh, a story that uh, um, a lady, you know, and it's, it's Facebook, so I don't know what it is, but what, who, what her name is, but um, Oxford's wrote in, and she says that she's been doing the crock pet diet for her doggies for two to three years now, which is awesome. Um, and then, you know, the, the little dogs are Scotties, and, and unfortunately, Scotties are predisposed to liver issues. And uh, lo and behold, before starting the crock pet diet, she'd been feeding them a, an extremely high quality uh, brand, if you will, um, to um, you know to help keep them healthy and all that good stuff. And in spite of that, their liver enzymes jacked up, which is just not cool. Um, so they, you know, she was really frustrated with this. Uh, you know, in conventional veterinary medicine, we really don't have a great answer about what to do to that, about liver enzymes that are elevated, but the dogs aren't sick. Um, we, it's a worrisome thing, of course, because we know something's going on, but we're not sure quite how to address it. So she found the crock pet diet and started doing it. And the other awesome thing that happened, aside from the liver enzyme values actually going back to normal, which is fantastic, is that they both drop three to five pounds a piece, which is a lot for a little Scotty dog. You know, so most of these guys are somewhere around 15 pounds of body weight, so that's huge. Five pounds is just, I mean, that's like a third of their potential body weight, which is just insane. So these guys got nice and lean. Um, one of the Scotties got uh, transitional cell carcinoma, which is a bladder cancer that can really be a hot mess. Uh, and some tumors in the mouth. Interestingly, the tumors in, in the dog's mouth fell off on their own, which is awesome. And then the bladder tumor, um, while that can be a really awful thing, the great thing for this pup is that it was on a tiny stalk, and so it was able to be removed surgically, and this pup never looked back. She says that he's never received chemo or any other treatment, and one year post-surgery, no evidence of this tumor coming back, which is awesome. Um, he is 12 years old and has more energy than three two-year-old kids, she says, and she's one grateful person. So that is why I keep doing this. The crock pet diet is my, my way of looking at nutrition about what's working on the human side. And because dogs have evolved with us, essentially, um, they've been eating what we've been eating, first our garbage, then our leftovers and then kind of what we were cooking for them is agriculture changed things a bit. And so this really, to me, makes a lot of sense. The vegetables are in there to help your pet's body do its own work as far as fighting off cancer, uh, correcting liver malfunctions, kidney malfunctions, things of that nature. So that's awesome. So that's why on the human spear, there's so much interest in paleo diet. There is a lot in the crock pet diet that mimics paleo, and really the basic concept for both of them is whole food nutrition, and using the phytonutrients that are available in foods to help keep um, to help keep your pet working well. So that's what I know um, about that, and I am so delighted to hear that from from Oxford's about her Scotties. That's just awesome. I've unfortunately seen a number of um, a number of Scotties have chronically elevated liver enzymes and in later life develop liver cancer, which is just horrible. So, awesome. We've got a couple of questions from, from the uh, boards and hopefully this thing will keep playing with me right and let me see your questions if you're asking any of them. 
Um, Marilyn wrote in to um, ask about her chihuahua, which I mentioned earlier. And again, I'm going to address that in a wee bit. And then Angela wrote in about suggestions for her dog who has itchy skin. And, you know, it's hard to answer that question with just that uh, piece of information. Sometimes dogs are itchy all year long. Sometimes it's seasonal allergies. And um, so it's important to make that distinction. I think certainly one of the first things you want to work on doing is, is the diet. And if you're not feeding the crock pet diet, I certainly would. Uh, it's just for, for many reasons. One is if there are any food sensitivities going on, then it can help alleviate those and also importantly help you identify which foods are creating issues. So that's, that's an important first step. step. Uh, probiotics have been tremendously helpful. As we've discussed multiple times in the past, your immune system isn't just in your lymph nodes and spleen and things of that nature. 70% of your immune system function resides in your gut. And so if the good guys are in charge, then it's going to work a whole lot better than if the bad guys, the bad bugs, are in charge. And if the bad guys are in charge, they're producing all these inflammatory components and molecules that just kind of upset the apple cart, you know, regardless of of what you're doing in spite of medication or Benadryl or supplements and what have you. So fix the gut first, get those probiotics in there. Quercetin and stinging nettles are awesome for um, seasonal allergies in particular, flea allergies, things like that. One of our cats, Pepe, has uh, flea allergy dermatitis. And what we've been able to do is use quercetin and nettles to reduce his itchiness to the point where he's not needing additional flea medication, he's not scratching big sores in his skin, things of things like that. So that's great. There's a product on my website called Allerol, which is a combination of zinc, quercetin, nettles, and several other things that help to modulate the immune system so that it responds more appropriately to the allergens that are out there. Um, the, you know, certainly you can use fish oil that helps to reduce inflammation and itchiness. Coconut oil is another thing that's very helpful as well. So there's a ton of different options out there to help with itchy skin. Bathing frequently is important. Um, if it does seem to be seasonal allergies, and right now this is prime time for pollen season, uh, th you know, simple things like wiping off your dog's belly, their feet, and their feet when they come in from outside with a damp washcloth is great. I wouldn't use baby wipes just because they've got a bunch of junk in there to make them stay damp. Um, bathing more frequently, wiping the entire body down with a damp washcloth once a day, those are all important things. Um, apple cider vinegar, you can take an ounce of apple cider vinegar, mix it with about a pint of water, and use that as a spray so you can spray their backs, their tummies, and any, any kind of hot spotty areas, places where they're super itchy and starting to make some sores. So those are all things you can try. Um, that's, those have all typically been very helpful. Um, Tina Black uh, asked about her kitty who is unfortunately in first stage liver failure and she's not sure what to give him food wise. And I think the first thing is with kitties, yes, I'm going to tell you to feed the crock pet diet. But the important thing with cats is, is your cat eating dry food or canned food? Uh, because if they're eating dry food first, cats are very particular about food. And so if you try to go from dry food to the cooked food, the crock pet diet, oftentimes that fails just because cats are truly dry food junkies. Um, the dry food is sprayed with fat on the outside and it's like, kitty crack, as you've probably heard a lot of people talk about. So convert first from dry food to canned food. Try to go to one that doesn't have a bunch of stuff you can't pronounce in it. Same thing with the dry food. And then if they're already eating canned food, then go ahead and start switching gradually to the original crock pet diet. And again, same thing with, um, with allergies. You know, you can help improve liver function simply because you're including vegetables like brassicas, so kale, broccoli, things of that nature, that actually help to improve liver function. The other thing is, is that it is much closer to what the cat, you know, to, to the cat eating a mouse as far as the protein, carbohydrate, and fat 
uh, macro ratios. And so what that does is put this cat back into normal physiology. There's a great deal of discussion that many diseases in cats such as hyperthyroidism are really just a problem with liver, the liver's inability to get rid of garbage. So work on that first. I would look at using supplements like milk thistle and again probiotics and fish oil because if one of the roles of the probiotic organisms in the gut is to help get rid of garbage and so by doing that you reduce the load on the liver to get um, to help get the garbage out of the system. So I would definitely look into that. Quercetin and nettles again can be helpful. Quercetin is a super potent antioxidant and it's very good at helping to clean things up. It can be a little difficult getting that into cats so I think fish oil is probably a safer bet to start with. Uh, again the goal there is to reduce inflammation and restore physiology to more normal functioning. So anything that you can do to help the physiology work better takes the load off of the liver. So I hope that's helpful for you, Tina. Um, it's just, uh, it's not fun to hear that, but we've seen so many of these guys return to more normal function just by changing what they're eating and using a few basic supplements. If that's not cutting it, and what I would do is, you know, start instituting those changes. Don't do it all at once, particularly if your cat is, um, really finicky on the food and stuff, just go slowly and uh, see what that does. Get your kitty's liver values retested in a couple of weeks and see what's going on there. Uh, and if you're getting improvements, awesome. If you're not starting to see improvements, then let me know what I can do to help you more with that. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we discovered last night that uh, Gracie is not She's, she's afraid of thunderstorms, not the, uh, not the thunder part so much because she can't hear it unless it's really super loud. But the flashing of lightning just really freaks her out. And so that's, that's not fun. And um, the problem is, is that it isn't just, it's just a bear and you're, you know, for dogs that are not able to... Um, handle it. You know, owners are up all night because the dog's up all night and life just gets a little bit miserable. So some of the, the things that have worked well for us in the past are Thunder Shirts, Liquid Nutricalm, which is available on the website, has been awesome. That is a tryptophan and theanine product. It helps to really kind of take the edge down so that they're not so anxious. Um, recently, and we, I started using uh, Calm, C-A-L-M-Z vest for, uh, for our older dog, Sam, that's unfortunately no longer with us. And it made an enormous difference. So this week, we're going to work on acclimating Gracie to that Calm's vest and see if that helps for her. It does a couple of really interesting things. And one is that um, it helps to, it vibrates. Uh, right on a uh, an acupuncture point that helps to uh, create a little calming. It plays Fertilese, which is a piece of music, classical music, that's been well researched to be shown to be quite calming for children that are autistic. And then the third thing it does is it plays these binaural beats, which help to reset the brain waves down into theta waves, which are the more calming brain waves. So I would definitely look into that. Um, Adaptal collars or sprays have been helpful. Uh, calming caps, these are all things that can be helpful. The, you know, the thing that really helped her settle down last night was we got up out of bed, put a dog bed in the closet where it's nice and dark and we can shut the door so she's not seeing the thunder flashing. And she was able to settle and calm herself down. So that's, uh, that's another great solution there as well. Um, you know, there's a wide range of medication, but if we can just help her figure out how to calm herself down and give her a place where it's safer and easier to stay calm, that often works much better. Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on out there as far as um, different herbal supplements and this and that and the other. Um, those are the things that I've found to work really well. A lot of folks will try to use Bach Flower Remedies or um, Happy Travelers, another one. And I, unfortunately, I've just not ever seen those work very well. So 
um, that one you know those you can try them see if you see if you get any response but I would say over over a decade for black Bach flower remedies in particular I'd say maybe one or two dogs out of hundreds have have seen some help with that so back to Marilyn's question, which is about her year-old chihuahua that is just not wanting to go outside and take a walk. Uh, she's just really nervous and panicky and that kind of stuff. So she tries every day to take her for a walk. The dog won't walk. She doesn't want to drag her down the street. Um, yeah, Sally, it was quite a, quite a storm. I'm hoping you're, you're finding out that Pepper was not... Uh, afraid of them as well, afraid of the storm. Sally is the person that um, did the did the hard work of getting Gracie out of the shelter and fostered her for probably almost three months. And um, so she's a wonderful woman and does a lot of good work for English setters. But, but anyway, so back to Marilyn's problem. So here's this poor little chihuahua that is just freaked out about going, uh, you know, going outside. And um, so you can apply some of those same ideas. Yeah, Susan, I bet, I bet Laura had a long, miserable light night last night, too, with her rescue boykin. So we'll, uh, we'll get, get that squared away. And Piper, Piper's with her new family. That is awesome, Sally. That was really pretty quick turnaround. So for this poor little chihuahua, what can she do? Um, the old-fashioned way is to just do what she's been doing, uh, which is to take her outside, walk away, and then the dog runs back home because it's all freaked out and wants to get back to safety. And really what you need to do is start slower. So that idea of immersion therapy, so you know, if you're afraid of spiders, you go somewhere and some psychologist puts your hand in a box of spiders, it just doesn't work. You, it just makes your fear get much worse. Um, you know, There's been a few cases where people that were trying to figure out how to, to be able to fly again. They just got on the plane and got dealt with it and got through it. And about 50% of the time that works for people, but it's extremely stressful. And for dogs, what that tends to do is just worsen their fearful, fearfulness. So you wanna, with any kind of phobia, you wanna figure out where is the point where the dog is just beginning to show you that it's a little bit freaked out. Where does you know that wide-eyed expression start? The ears pinned back, uh, those kinds of things start to pop up. And your goal is to take your dog to just before that place, and um, use things like the Calm's vest, like a Thunder shirt, like Liquid Nutra Calm. Uh, for dogs that are just generally freaked out about life, you know it's a rescue dog. It's come out of a terrible situation they're in a whole new world, they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, that's where Nutricalm on a daily basis, twice a day basis, can be very, very helpful. You can start with a higher dose. As you start to see your dog being able to take on more things without so much fear, then you can start to titrate that dose down. Adaptal collars are awesome for this because it's like they've got their own little happy bubble wherever they go. So that's a great idea. And then you know, try to figure out where this little puppy's uh, freak out point is, or really prior to freak out, where they're showing you that they're starting to get alarmed. And so sometimes they get alarmed because we do, we all are creatures of habit, and so we do things in a um, stepwise fashion to get ready to go to work, or, you know, for dogs that have separation anxiety, or to get ready to go outside, and we're like, oh my God, this dog is gonna freak out and I don't want it to, so we talk to it in a really high squeaky voice, which freaks the dog out even more because it knows what's coming next, because that's the only time you use that voice. So pay attention to what you might normally do before you get ready to take the dog outside, and then back it up three steps. And that's where you want to get the dog where it's happy, reward it, and then nothing happens. So, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. So it's not queuing in on that, whatever that thing is, as a message that all of a sudden life is going to get horrifying. So the goal is to take it stepwise into little pieces. The other thing you might try with this little pup, because it is so tiny, is to put it in a safe environment. So literally like a backpack. 
that you can, uh, I mean, and I know they make these things, um, that has a, you know, the dog is enclosed, but it's got a window out, so to speak, so that they can look out and see around and, um, you know, see what's going on, but be less threatened because they're not outside in the big world where they're afraid some bird of prey is going to scoop down and eat them. So uh, just start slowly. Find a local trainer, if you can, that can help you uh, work through some of these issues because they, they know how to pick up on the early cues about when things are, when this dog is starting to really kind of freak out. So that's where I would start. Start with those more natural ways to kind of help bring the stress level down and calm the puppy down before they even have a chance to get amped out. So the goal is to take them just before you figured out where that amp out, freak out time is, and then start to kind of bring, you know, just work them gradually up a little bit further into that progression of steps of actually going outside. So I hope that's helpful. Um, we had some questions on the, uh, the original Croc Pet Diet Pet Chefs community post about, um, about fruit and using fruit in the Croc Pet Diet. And I typically don't recommend doing that for a couple of reasons. Hey, Lisa, good to see you. I hope you're, you and Brandy are doing well. The thing with fruit is it's great stuff, um, but when you cook it, you take the sugar away from that fiber that helps to blunt the insulin response. And so it's not that you should never cook fruit, but I wouldn't make it a routine in uh, in the crock pet diet use use fruits as treats so blueberries strawberries grapes are okay you know little bits here and there and um, just little bits as treats um, there are some fruit powders which basically have the sugar taken out of that uh, that you can sprinkle on top of the food so that you can add more of those phytonutrients that are available in fruits, especially blueberries and blackberries, things of that nature. So that's a great idea. Um, you know, use, use pieces of apple as a treat, things of that nature. Uh, the other question that came up on that site was um, the impact of commercial meats versus organic or natural meats. And you know, this is something we all struggle with. I would love to tell you that, yes, you should only feed your pet natural meats or organically produced meats because they are the best, and they truly are. However, you know, we've got seven cats, and I can't, I can't afford to do that for, excuse me, four cats and three dogs. I can't afford to feed them all. It's something that we make a priority for ourselves simply because... It's, you know, with the health issues I've had in my past and unfortunately I've been dealing with recently, it's just imperative that my diet remain as clean as it possibly can. So what can you do to minimize the amount of garbage that's in the commercial, the commercial meats? One thing is um, get the leanest cuts you can possibly find. So, for instance, uh, you know, turkey breasts, uh, boneless, skinless chicken breasts, or you know, just get chicken thighs for that matter, and yank the skin off before they go in. And um, uh, pork loins; uh, those are all really low-fat cuts. Avoid ground meats because they contain pink slime. Pink slime is really just as gross as it sounds. It's essentially sort of leftover bits from the cutting room floor. Um, there's quite a bit of fat in that as well, and uh, they're digested, they're kind of mixed together and then digested with ammonia to provide this really disgusting stuff, which interestingly enough, McDonald's is finally getting the message and beginning to take that out of their beef, which is, which is a good step. Um, so the reason the fat is the issue is that the way commercial animals are fed is with a highly processed grain diet, which is what we're all trying to avoid, right? That's why you're interested in the crock pet diet because it's, um, it does include you know, some grains which tend to be non-glutinous, but they're whole grains. They're not this wheat middlings with God knows what in it, like you know, what's, what's in many of the uh, commercial foods. So 
because of the way these animals are fed, it changes the omega-6 to 3 fatty acid ratio in the fat. And so we go from a grass-fed animal has the proper ratio between those two omega fatty acids. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. So you want to reduce the amount of omega-6 fatty acids being given to your pet. The way to do that with a commercial meat is to go with the leanest cuts possibly available. Um, so that's kind of the rationale there. There's a lot of uh, just scary stuff that the uh, that the meat industry does, and it's um, it's just a it's a frustrating thing. They're starting to get the message simply because we're demanding that they not a produce this and uh, their animals in this way, and and the way that the animals are being produced is terribly cruel in many cases, and um, we're also demanding that the antibiotics go away, the hormones go away, things of that nature. So that's the other issue is that hormones, for instance, in cattle, uh, they typically use growth hormones in beef cattle to make them grow faster. In dairy cattle, um, they use them to help make them make more milk, and then when they go to slaughter, they've got all this stuff on board. So they're starting to respond to the idea that we don't want that stuff so much. If you can find a local farmer or a local butcher that deals with um, more natural or organic cuts of meat, then I would definitely strike up a conversation with them and see if you can get their trimmings. At one of our local, um, uh, it's not a, well, it's Earth Fair is local to the southeast, I think, and it's somewhat similar to Whole Foods. They'll have mixed grind available in the freezer section every now and again. And basically, it's kind of what's left over from processing natural proteins, which is great. So that's the way I would approach it. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those conundrums. I'd love to tell you to go out and get all the natural and organic meats only for your pets, but unfortunately, it's just an expensive proposition. If you can afford to do it, by all means, do that. Um, try, to, try to work with your local farmers if you have that luxury available and on John's Island we do. I mean we're so blessed with local farming it's just amazing. Um, but try to work that out and see if that uh, see if you can come up with a better option there. For folks that live in an area where there's a lot of hunting you know so deer and things of that nature that's a great option as well. I mean there's nothing more free range than a deer right? These guys are just running around and eating for a living and um, it's you know that's a that's a fantastic option so um, and then Aaron's asking besides pork beef and turkey what other meats or proteins are cooling um, and Aaron I think we, we talked about this on the crock pet community chefs community I'm gonna upload a um, a uh, traditional Chinese veterinary medicine uh, look at what's cooling and what's not cooling. But in general, duck, uh, white fishes, things of that nature, those are great options. Tilapia, I would avoid. Almost all of it is farm-raised. And the way that they raise the tilapia is unfortunately very pro-inflammatory. So white fishes are a great option. And really, that's that's kind of it. There's not a lot of other, other options out there. Um, so I would look at that. Um, if you're in an area, so we're in the coast, and what we typically, what I typically would um, recommend is whiting because it's a local white fish, uh, and you know it's it's fresh caught, it's awesome, and uh, great. Yeah, tilapia is garbage. I mean, there there are studies out there showing just how pro-inflammatory that particular food is. Um, the other thing is, too, is that let's say your pet is sensitive to uh, duck or whitefish uh, but maybe can handle pork, but you're still wanting to rotate proteins. It's not that you should never feed chicken, but what you need to do is balance it with more cooling stuff. So more, uh, more vegetables, um, more of the cooling, you know, more of those cooling green veggies are always considered to be uh, very 
cooling protein. So that's it. So we get into this mindset in America that it's all or nothing. And the truth is, is that um, it's, you know, we have to seek balance. We have to look at what's available with us and then readjust things in general. The most important thing to remember is that while it's ideal to feed, you know, feed appropriately for, for if your dog is hot, you want to cool it down, and, you know, if they're cool, you want to warm them up, and vice versa, particularly for those dogs that are hot, stepping away from dry food is like the most cooling thing you can do because the way that dry food is typically produced with extrusion and heating and all of those things, there's a terrific amount of cooling in them, uh, or heat in that diet. And so by slow cooking, like the crock pot does, and although we talked about that last time, so hope you all are busting out the, uh, your mama's soup kettles and uh, roaster ovens, um, that's really a huge step. And then offering other things that will be more cooling in nature to kind of counter what's working or not working. So that's what I know for today. Have you guys, I've got, have you guys got any other questions I can answer for you today? And uh, I'll get that done. Please keep the questions coming. I really, really enjoy getting them answered for you, helping you find, uh, get a start on what to do with um, with your pets if you just don't have access to a holistic veterinarian in your area. So um, that's what I've got. You are welcome, Erin. Great to see you, Sally. Uh, great to see you, Susan. Hope, uh, uh, hopefully uh, hopefully, uh, your daughter got more sleep last night than we did. We finally figured it out for Gracie and took turns with her and got her settled down, but that was a heck of a storm last night. So until next week, you all have a wonderful week. And remember, your pet's best health starts in the bowl. Many thanks. Cheers.